Thank you very much. It's very good to be here. I'm going to follow this up by talking a bit about international action and about the politics of the action. Well, first on international action. I think it's been very clear from what uh, Stephanie in particular has said that there are very big problems about countries going it alone. There's a certain amount countries can do by themselves, but they're problems because they s if they soon run into problems, they can't sell their exports because other countries are depressed. They have balance of payments problems. The market creates problems. In fact, in the 1930s, Joan Robinson, I think, coined the phrase, beggar my neighbor policies, which meant that one country put up protection, then another put up protection, then a third one did, and everybody was worse off. Now, this is well known now, and all the politicians accept it. And so you hear Cameron saying, we mustn't have more protection, we mustn't have more protection. But we've got a new form of beggar my neighbor policy, and it's austerity. I have austerity, that makes you have austerity, that makes you have austerity. We all have austerity, and we all end up in a wilderness. Um, so you need collective action. Uh, uh, even the developing countries are now finding the first time around, as Stephanie said, they were able to have a stimulus, but now they're up against problems. Only very large countries can go it alone. I think China probably can, the US can, and they, but they have political problems, and Europe. And that's why Stephanie's quite right to emphasize Europe. So we need global action. We need global action also because things like a financial tax, a Tobin tax, needs to be really introduced globally. I think it's worth trying to do it nationally, but essentially that, that will probably lead to evasion. And so you need global action. You need global action on regulation of the international system. We have global corporations. Co corporations can't really be regulated unless they're regulated globally because they can always move to another country and get uh, out of the situation. We have environmental issues which are essentially global. And if you, again, there's very little incentive for one country to act if no one else is acting. So it's clear that we do need global action and it's clear that we're not getting it. In um, 2008, there was a, a coming together of leaders in the light of the crisis, uh, in the light of the financial crisis. And they did collectively agree on a stimulus, and it did have a good effect, and, and we saw that in the subsequent years. Uh, but this leadership and desire for co coordination is completely lacking now. Uh, I know countries meet in the G8, and you can see the beautiful swimming pools, and you know, but that's what it seems to be at the moment, <laughs> rather than actually taking collective action. And who, where are our global institutions? Of course, we have the IMF and we have the World Bank, essentially defective because they're not democratically controlled. They're, they're just controlled essentially by the donor countries. But more than that, <coughs> they treat countries one by one. In fact, they, uh, particularly the IMF, preach the austerity message. One country do this, one country do this, and then collectively we come back to the collective suicide point. In addition to which, they have the wrong philosophy. Uh, they believe in all these old-fashioned ideas of austerity and so on. They have not learned the Keynesian message at all. Uh, they don't uh, have inequality as a, a central problem. Um, and so they're part of the problem. They were the ones who preached the deregulation, which has caused the problem. Well, then we have the United Nations. And the uh, United Nations, is philosophy is okay, its objective is okay, but it's unfortunately a weak institution, which it finds it very difficult to take collective action, particularly on economic and social matters. And this is partly an institutional issue that we lack an economic and social security council. We've got a security council, but not one which addresses economic and social problems. And I think uh, there's general agreement that, that we do need such a thing. But even that won't work without the leaders wanting to take the right action. And we see that in the security field itself. We have Syria happening, and the proper security council is unable to take action. Then we have the G20, which is very ad hoc, not very democratic. Uh, again, leadership and coordination is lacking. So having said that, it's clear that we're coming to a situation in which there's a political problem. I mean, we believe there is not an economic problem. We believe there is a technical solution, but there is a political problem. There's a problem of wanting to do the right thing. And it's extraordinary, really, when you look at it. We have democratic governments in which the majority of people, by definition, 
have less than the average income. So the majority of people poor would gain by full employment, would gain by equality, would gain by all the policies we're saying, and yet we have governments which pursue policies which create unemployment, which create, allow for these huge bonuses and so on, uh, which allow for deregulation, which cut uh, the social expenditures that we all care about, um, which cut employment and growth. Why? It just is weird. I mean, anyone who told you about that would say, well, I can understand that in a non-democratic country, but how can this happen? And I think one of the answers is we don't have democracies, we have plutocracies, mm. by which I mean that the, the finance for our politics and the lobbying about our politics comes from companies and the rich. There's huge power of these corporations. In the United States, with the recent decision on the tax, <coughs> it's just absurd. I mean, they run the thing, and the amount of money that's spent is just, you, you just buy your seat or whatever. But even here, uh, the companies are hugely powerful through the press, as well as and their ownership of the press, as well as through lobbying and through finance of p political parties. Uh, some governments essentially really represent the interests of these companies and of finance and so on. But even more progressive governments are afraid of their power. So Obama is clearly very afraid of challenging these interests. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's also constrained by Congress. Um, in this country, you find that Cameron spends his whole time representing the city, essentially. <laughs> he goes abroad and has a veto. He says on behalf of UK, it's on behalf of the city. What does the city do for us? The city is behind so much of our problems. We didn't have a city, we didn't have to represent the city, we could represent the people. Um, so you get all the cutbacks and so on in the service of something which is essentially, as, you as Stephanie said, lacking in value. All right, so what can we do? Given that we agree with be outraged, but we need to take action. One type of action is to reform campaign finance. And this is uh, something I think which has got to come in democratic societies. And incidentally, democracy itself will be threatened if these policies go on. That's another of the lessons of the 20s and 30s. Um, we need restrictions on lobbying. We need to regulate the press, and at least we're beginning just at the moment in this country to think about those issues. We need much bigger walls between the private sector and the public sector, mm. so people don't move in and out. And of course, it's getting much worse in this country because of privatization of services. There's all sorts of cozy relationships between the private and the public sector, in which the private sector determines what happens. Um, then, of course, we need political campaigns in which people get together and press for what they want, using the media, using all the other methods at the disposal of a political campaign. And it, one of the things I, I mean, after a long career in development economics, I came to realize that it's really all about politics. So I perhaps was studying the wrong thing. And I began to study the politics. And you find that it's when people organize together that policy change happens. And I find that in Latin America. You find that in India. You find that in the UK. So that's really the simple message that I came out about it, uh, at it. And then finally, we need to publicize what's going on, challenge the politicians, challenge the view, put forward the view that people are being sacrificed for profits. And that's really what we're trying to do here. And I would add to what Richard said about not being uh, the hoodwinking mm. phrase of uh, Joan Robinson. You learn economics not only not to be hoodwinked by other economists, but not to be hoodwinked by politicians. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to end by saying that what we're trying to do here, and we're being led by Richard Jollyan, just a, a footnote that Andrea Cornia and I were organizing a conference in honor mm. of Richard Jolly last autumn. And it was all very academic and stuff, and we're going to have a nice volume. And Richard, how oh, we don't want a volume, we want a pamphlet. <laughs> <laughs> and he was furious with us. And he's so much more efficient than us. He's got his pom pamphlet. We're still busy doing our volume. You know, it'll come out eventually. And I do think it's terrific, Richard, that you have led this, which we all tremendously support you in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis.